Yeah, hello. We are in March and at Women Matters. And today, Christine will lead us through the session and present something we will hear afterwards. But before we do that, uh, the check-ins, the normal check-ins, and I will start. And I'm, as I said already to Haneli today, it was a wonderful sunny day and I was lying outside in front of these lovely flowers. And I didn't want to come in because inside it's cold and outside is relatively, you know, when you are really hot in the sun and inside. And so now, uh, I don't know if it's cold or it's, it's warm, but it's, I'm so glad that we are going into spring now and in the beauty of the world. So I give over to where autumn is beginning. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's me. <laughs> I'm Anneli, I'm here in South Africa still. And um, yes, we are really entering autumn. At night, it's getting chilly. And we also have some cold days suddenly. Um, and yes, it's interesting. We've gone down to like down level one, so we have more. We are more free, but we still can't enter other parts of the world. Um, and uh, yesterday, I had a very interesting experience. I was sitting writing, and suddenly, I just almost fainted. And I had a very dizzy spell, and I'm glad I'm feeling much better now. So I'm grateful to be here with you all. And I pass to Beatrice. I'm still finishing my breakfast. <laughs> um, hello. I'm in Brooklyn, New York. And um, there's still snow on, on the ground, but it's getting warmer. So it's slowly melting away. We just had so much of it recently that it hasn't gone away yet. But I don't think we're going to get any more snowfall, which is too bad. I like it. We're definitely entering into spring. Um, I'm figuring out which coats are right to wear outside because <laughs> um, my big, my big fluffy cold coat is not appropriate anymore. Um, there's been a lot going on. Um, the nonprofit that I was working on is uh, looks like it's not going to be possible um, because the owner of the garden that we were going to be in. Um, has decided that he wants to build on the property. Mm. Um, and so that's a disappointment and there's been a lot of uh, drama and back and forth around that. Um, but we're still hoping to find a way to continue the vision and preserve uh, Ken's artistic legacy, which was one of the main ideas uh, through other projects. So we're Hello. figuring out how to do that. Can you hear me? Um, and I recently, oh, can you not hear me? Oh yeah, hi Monia. We're just doing check-in. Um, and, uh, last night I did a, a little performance as part of a concert on zoom. Um, and it went really well and that was exciting. And I feel like I'm finally doing creative things again. Um, so I'm excited to start working on new projects. So that's, that's, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling, maybe it's spring, maybe it's the energy of spring, but I'm feeling... <laughs> ready to create and, and let some things bloom. So that's that's my check-in, which is, it's a good feeling to be feeling creative again. And I will pass to Christine. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm in Carlsbad, California. And, um, you know, I'm not even sure what has happened in the past two weeks. Uh, Nothing in particular. I've been preparing for this presentation and uh, meeting with people um, on Zoom. Uh, yeah, I mean, not a whole lot going on. It's been warmer weather, enjoying that. And uh, I did have a thought and a minute ago while Beatrice was talking and now it's already left my mind. <laughs> so that's my check-in. <laughs> And I will pass to um, Victoria. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm in La Mesa. Um, 
Oh, nobody knows where that is. Well, you know where it is, Christine. Um, what happened to Beatrice? Oh, she's eating her breakfast probably still. <laughs> Sorry, I just woke up. Um, so I'm disoriented. I had a very, very bad dream. So I'm glad to be awake. I'm glad I'm out of the darkness and the confusion. Um, and I'm, I'm preparing for a really huge um, concert. Well, it's actually two concerts. It'll be my first concerts online um, at the end of this month and the beginning of April. And so it's, there's a lot of stress because I have, I have to, it's the repertoire and also adjusting to being online and figuring out how to record so it sounds good. So that's pretty much what's occupying me <clears throat> these days. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, and um, I will pass to Monia. Yeah, um, thank you, Heidi, for notifying me. I just I didn't write it down. I don't know why. We were just watching the news uh, about the lockdown in Austria. And it has been postponed to six o'clock because nobody knows what you really need and want. And it's just very confusing times. The sun is shining, spring is coming. And I just wanted to say that I love Patricia's photo. The one she puts on, I really have to get something like that too. She looks very smart on it. Yeah, uh, what is the topic of today? Easter through an integral lens. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you, I pass on to Gertrude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm in the middle of Germany, north of Frankfurt. Um, and uh, I was just thinking what happened the last few years. I think I got a lot of loads off my, my back, off my shoulders, so like, taxes, applying for a conference workshop. The, so everything that was there for weeks <laughs> to be finished. And, and I even managed on my own to do a tiny little uh, video to, to invite people to the workshop. So one, one minute, 19 seconds, because <laughs> I was so proud. <laughs> Yeah, so so somehow it's lighter. Yeah, and I've been meditating quite a bit lately, which is good, which feels good. So I hand over to you, Christine, to... Okay, good. Thank you. Thanks. Get us the big picture. <laughs> okay, so um, my topic is Easter through an integral lens. Um, I'm doing this talk for San Diego Integral in a couple of weeks, and I'm doing it with two other people. So I can only give you my portion, but um, we have a two hour meeting at San Diego Integral and my portion is supposed to be about half an hour uh, and they'll each do half an hour, so. Unfortunately, you won't hear the beginning part because I am going to be the third person. I'm talking about the resurrection. So I guess I'll begin just by kind of introducing my um, spiritual background. Uh, so I was raised Protestant, um, Lutheran, and uh, was involved in my church a lot as a kid. You know, my parents went regularly, had a lot of activities uh, all through high school. Uh, at church. And then, of course, you know, once I left home, that dropped off, as it often does for young adults. And I didn't return to going to church until um, I was starting a family and uh, wanted my children to be exposed to that. So found a Lutheran church in California. It's very progressive, um, definitely postmodern, if not some integral sensibilities, but definitely postmodern and, and progressive. Um, and then as I've become more interested in integral, and especially with the pandemic and some other things happened, um, I really haven't been to church in over a year. 
they do it on Zoom. I haven't really bothered to do that, but I've been kind of looking at other things about spirituality anyway um, with meditation. Um, I briefly did some transcendental meditation during college, probably spent about four years, maybe five years doing uh, TM uh, also. Um, I don't have a regular practice at this point in time. Um, I do some meditation and do some uh, contemplative prayer, but don't really have anything that I practice regularly, which I'm kind of embarrassed to say, I think I should, but uh, I don't. So that's kind of my background. And um, the portion of Easter that I'm gonna be talking about is specifically resurrection. So you can see why I'm the third person in, in our talk. I'm, I'm talking about the, the big thing. Um, so of course, Easter is the most significant of all the Christian holidays because uh, if Jesus wasn't resurrected, um, he would be just another guy, another prophet, right? He had to be resurrected to um, convey a, a different spiritual message about how to come to God. Um, and it's, it's interesting, I just realized as, as Hanali was talking, Easter is so associated with spring and rebirth and new beginnings. And I realized that's only true for the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, it must be a bummer that um, holidays are often associated, Christmas is associated with snowmen <laughs> and Santa Claus and things like that. Um, and Easter is very much a, a springtime thing with flowers and bunnies and, and whatnot. So that I'm, I'm just realizing that that would be strange if I lived in the Southern hemisphere. Um, but regardless, uh, Jesus um, was crucified and then resurrected and then ascended into heaven. Um, and it was in his life that he was considered maybe a prophet, a rabbi, a teacher, but it was through his resurrection that he became Christ. So he wasn't called Christ before uh, the resurrection. Um, and Christ means the anointed one, so the holy one. Uh, resurrection has a lot of different ideas associated with it, okay? Um, it is transformation and positive change. It's rebirth, letting go of the false self or the ego. It is awakening to your true self integration of your fragmented self. It is evolution, it's emergence, it is uh, undying spirit. It is going beyond the flesh into something that is always there, eternal, um, always and already. It's liberation and salvation. So those are some of the ways that people talk about what resurrection is. Um, certainly not in a mythic literal sense of being brought back to life, but really uh, resurrection as more of a journey. Uh, it's a journey, it's a pathway. And um, Jesus as the person went through this pathway and then shared it so that other people might have have a, a similar opportunity to go through this pathway and be joined uh, with the divine. Um, Wilbur, well, before I get into that, um, there's obviously a lot of emphasis on uh, Jesus being crucified uh, and the suffering of that. And um, some of that is, uh, is necessary because he made a sacrifice in, in Christian theology. Obviously, it was a sacrifice to save people and their salvation involved in, in his crucifixion. Um, not so much the resurrection, but the fact that he was willing to die, and that would be for the forgiveness of everybody else's sins. Um, 
if you were raised Catholic, the cross has Jesus on it and it's called a crucifix and you see him on the cross. And so the emphasis really is on his sacrifice and the whole idea of salvation. Um, Protestant religions, um, and I believe Eastern Christianity, although I'm not entirely sure about that. Uh, maybe somebody else knows, but uh, Eastern uh, religions, um, I mean, Protestant religions just show the cross and Jesus is not on it. So it is more representative, uh, not of his death, but of the resurrection because he is no longer on the cross and, and he's, he's risen. So that's an interesting distinction of where the emphasis gets put in various Christian uh, religions. But the idea is that there has to be a darkness for us, that the most profound um, doorways into transformation and liberation uh, come through a dark place. And the darkness may be death. Um, it could be a loss or a trauma. Um, it could be fear. Uh, it, it's some shadowy place uh, that we have to pass through in order to emerge into something uh, something better and something uh, more divine. So the story of that um, is very important because again, think of it as a pathway. Think of it as a journey into something that connects you with the, the divine. So Wilbur talks about um, spiritual Spirituality, he emphasized this growing up and waking up, okay? So the growing up is the stages of development. Um, it's transcending to a higher level, being in, in transcend and include, but it is definitely the growing up is about uh, going up to second tier and hopefully into a, a, a worldview or a world perspective um, or, or a cosmic perspective. Um, and at second tier, if you're growing up into second tier, then there's this openness to change. There's an openness to uncertainty. There's an openness to paradox where you are able to withstand the idea that nothing is certain um, and that change uh, is all around us. Um, also kind of, again, representative of what resurrection uh, can be. So in growing up, our spirit is entrapped. Our spirit can emerge into something higher um, and move more into the mystery. So that's the growing up part. And often practices, this is where practices come in is to assist in that uh, transformation process. So waking up is really more of a state. It's not the stage or the level, but it is the state experience. It's the mystical experience of spirituality. Um, and it is changing consciousness so that it recognizes the divine and the spirit in all things. Um, we include ourselves in the divine and waking up to the divine within us. Uh, and the whole idea of being saved is really that our spirit can be released and our spirit can move more into mystery. So, you know, mythic interpretations of Jesus's death and the salvation that he offers might look at forgiveness of sins, but um, from a waking up or an integral perspective, it really is about your spirit being able to move more into mystery and into the divine. And that is what sa saves us or what salvation can be. So that's a lot of how Wilbur talks about growing up and waking up in spirituality. But I was thinking that, you know, uh, traditional Christianity talks a lot about cleaning up. Of course, they don't talk, say it's cleaning up, but they talk a lot about morals and what's good to do, what's bad to do. They're very uh, 
church teachings and even Jesus's teachings a lot focus on you should live this kind of a life, right? This is how you should live and you shouldn't do these other things. So there is a lot of of cleaning up and um, of, of course, traditional Christianity focuses on baptism, which is a cleaning up process at, right at the get go, <laughs> right as you're born, you get your first cleaning up process and, and it's with water, no less. So um, cleaning up in traditional Christianity might be about trying to get rid of sin. And from an integral perspective, you can consider sin more as just a separation from spirit or the divine. So sin is not so much something you've done or haven't done. You know, it's not about the doing so much, but it's more about um, getting off a path getting off the pathway of being able to emerge and getting off the pathway of, of being in touch with the divine. And then um, showing up would be the last, uh, the last way of um, working on uh, transcendence or emergence. Uh, and showing up is really just being your unique self, taking the role that you and only you can have in this life, you know, being your true self and showing up for that. Um, in traditional Christianity, they may talk about, of course, you know, you're supposed to go to church every Sunday. That would be a way of showing up. Um, and that's kind of uh, an expectation that's placed upon Christians to do that. Um, but also in, in a, maybe a more karmic way you may think about showing up as doing good deeds, as being there for your fellow man, about uh, offering yourself, in a sense, being uh, an offering to other people and to the world. Um, and so the way to kind of redeem ourselves is by showing up and by doing uh, the work of our lives and making the world uh, a better place. And this is kind of the path that Jesus lived um, as a man. You know, he showed up and he gave of himself and he did all these things that um, either healed people, mostly healed people. Um, and he never um, so much chastised people for his, his message wasn't to point out that people do bad things because he, you know, forgave and healed a lot of people who were considered unclean in that society. And he didn't mind living among unclean people. His gripes uh, were with the system, you know, that, that lower right quadrant, that's where he felt things were really amiss um, in his in his worldview. So if people the the upper right quadrant, what we do or who we are internally, he focused on a little bit, but not so much about the upper right quadrant. You know, he understood that people were trying to deal with and cope with the lower right quadrant, which is where he felt things were um, most unbalanced and. Um, were mostly the problems that kept people from the divine. That's where the sin, in a sense, the division from, from grace and from divinity really uh, landed. Um, so I, I wanna read one example of the resurrection story. And what I'd like you to do is, uh, listen for those themes of growing up, waking up, cleaning up and showing up and seeing if you can pick out any of those uh, in the story itself. Um, so we'll do that and then talk about it just for a few minutes. Um, everybody maybe can give their thoughts. And then uh, I'm gonna move in to talk about the three faces of spirit 
and we'll end with a meditation and then we can talk some more after the meditation. So right now I'm going to read a little bit. Um, this is from uh, the book of Luke. And he talks about the resurrection. It's labeled the resurrection. Very early on Sunday morning, the women who were Mary Magdalene and uh, Mary, the mother of, of Jesus, they take their spices they had prepared. They found that the stone covering the ent entrance to the tomb had been rolled aside. So they went in, but they couldn't find Jesus. They were puzzled, trying to think what could have happened to it. Suddenly, two men appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The men, the women were terrified and bowed before the men. Then the men asked, why are you looking in a tomb for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He has risen from the dead. Don't you remember what he told you back in Galilee? That the son of man must be betrayed in the hands of sinful men and be crucified and that he could raise again on the third day. They remembered that he had said this. So they rushed back to tell the 11 disciples everyone else who what had happened of course Judas was no longer with the other disciples he wasn't there the women who went to the tomb were Mary Magdalene Joanna Mary mother of James and several others they also they told the apostles what had happened and the story sounded like nonsense and the apostles didn't believe them however Peter ran to the tomb to look stooping he pe peered in and saw the empty linen wrappings and he went home again wondering what had happened. Uh, that same day, um, several of his followers were walking uh, to Jerusalem. And as they walked along, they were talking about what had happened. And suddenly Jesus himself comes along and joins them and walks beside them. But they didn't know who he was uh, because God from recognizing him. Jesus says, you seem to be in deep discussion about something. What are you concerned about? And they said, haven't you heard? <laughs> you must be the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't know what has just happened in the last few days. And Jesus asked, what happened? And so they told him what happened about the man from Nazareth um, and their teacher and this person who had done all these miracles and was highly regarded by both people and God. Um, we thought he was the Messiah and he had come to rescue Israel, but that happened days ago. And then women came and they found the tomb empty and his body is missing. Um, and the angel said that Jesus was alive, but now his body's gone. And Jesus says to them, you are such foolish people. You find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted by the prophets that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things in order to enter a time of glory? By this time, they were nearing Jerusalem and ending their journey, and Jesus went on, but they begged him to stay with them. So since it was late at night, he went with them, and they sat down to eat, and he took a small loaf of bread, asked God's blessing, broke it, and then gave it to them. Suddenly, their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and at that moment, he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts feel strangely warm as he walked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem, where the 11 disciples and other followers of Jesus were gathered. And when they were arrived, they were greeted with the report, the Lord has really risen. He has appeared to Peter. And then I'm going to skip a little bit. And then um, Again, Jesus appears to them and he says, I was with you before and I told you everything written about me by Moses and the prophets, and it has all come true. And he opened their minds to understand the many scriptures. And he said, it was written long ago that the Messiah must suffer and die and rise again from the dead on the third day. With my authority, take this message of repentance to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. It is for the forgiveness of sins for all who turn to me. You are witness to all these things. And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised, 
but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. And then as he was blessing them, he left and was taken up to heaven. Um, and the apostles then returned to Jerusalem filled with joy and praising God. So that's one of the accounts of the resurrection. And um, was wondering again, we're looking at growing up. Did they advance in any stages? Uh, waking up, what kind of state experience did they have? Cleaning up, what happened in terms of getting rid of sin and showing up? Um, how did that occur in the resurrection story? So I don't, uh, Heidi, what's the best way to have people? Should we just go around or should I ask for somebody's impressions? Uh, who, who wants to, to say something to any of these questions? Uh, come forward okay. and say something. Okay. I, I can start with uh, waking up. I think that was, first I have to say for me, it's really, weird to hear these stories in, in English. I've never heard them in English, so I, I hardly recognize anything. But um, the waking up thing, you know, when they realized out of the action of the breaking of the bread that it was him, and they didn't see it before, they didn't, they just felt something, but they didn't believe in the feeling and they had to have this moment and then they woke up to, to the reality. That's what I, so in waking up and I give over to who wants to say something about this. Well, the cleaning up was the, one of the more obvious ones. Did you hear what he said about cleaning up? Monia, you were about to say something. Maybe you say that first and then we... Uh, well, it was the same for me. It's the first time I heard it in English. <laughs> and there's so much memory of my childhood. But what struck me was uh, that he opened their mind. So it was not by themselves that they were able to bear witness. He opened their mind. And uh, sending the Holy Spirit uh, probably will cause the showing up of all the apostles, in my opinion, because mm -hmm. then you are no longer your limited ego. You are filled with Holy Spirit. Um, I was also amazed by because I'm just now very, very deep in uh, Zen meditation and uh, that the stages are somewhat similar in how you develop in Zen. And uh, yeah, so it's usually you get to the same final, to the same from all directions to exactly the same process. And that's... Uh, yeah, that's for me. Can you, can you say what you mean about how you saw the similarities? Like what, what seems similar no, to you? Uh, it's, it's rather difficult to, to put it into words. Um, but it's also about non-dualism. So as long as your mind keeps in the non, uh, insists on being in the, in the, dual, in the dual stage, you won't get to the point. And, uh, and even if it's only caused by breaking the bread that you notice who is talking to you, um, that's quite fascinating. Uh, so it's maybe just the little things we do every day to be our unique self and to be aware of it. That's what really struck me. I'm not sure about the cleansing, uh, but uh, the cleaning up, I mean, um, because being baptized, 
as a Catholic, as I am too, at an age when you really don't know what is happening to you. Uh, yeah, it's a kind of cleaning uh, that you didn't choose. Well, maybe you choose it by your birth. So then we get to reincarnation and so on and so on. And yeah. In German, it's it's uh, when you are get when you get baptized at a later age. I think in English it's Wiedertäufer. Uh, I don't know, know exactly, but to decide for yourself that you want to cleanse yourself, maybe you choose other ways of because when you are uh, and then I still remember the baptism of my second grandchild when the older brother was standing there and he didn't know what was going on. And he, he shouted, nicht aufen, nicht aufen, because he was afraid something might happen to her. Uh, they held her there and, and had a microphone there. So the whole church laughed <laughs> and then, yeah, and it went well. So she was also baptized. But uh, it's, it's something small children really can't figure out yet. So maybe that's, important to notice. Thank you. Whoever wants to continue. I thought it was interesting that they didn't recognize him uh, as he was walking by. It's like something changed in him. So, so as if like going into another state or whatever that might be that they couldn't so with their normal and past way of experiencing him they couldn't see that who that was when they met him again so there was something in unrecognizable about him and only by specific things that made this bridge to the to the known when they realized who it was so i thought that was whatever that uh, is but uh, that that was interesting and uh, as uh, monia was talking about when my daughters when they were uh, 15 and for for confirmation so they were not baptists as as children uh, they decided because of their friends and I don't know, but they decided they, they wanted to have that. And um, so they got baptized and conf uh, conf the confirmation at the same time, but they were the only one. So they were, they had to, the my double. Um, and when the, 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 the pastor said, he said, you are blessed and you will be a blessing for others. Uh -huh. So it was like, I have never heard that expression. I'm, I'm from the Catholic side. But this was like, as like initiation, there was something that happened that that day. And in that moment, I thought it was really interesting. It was, yeah, so you are blessed and you will be a blessing. And um, that's, that's in a way um, talking about uh, one of the three faces of spirit. It is the I am uh, to be a blessing and to be blessed is, you know, you are divine, you are everything. Um, you, you are both, you are you. And you are also divine. It's like those two things are both there um, within you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And another thing was the, this this uh, building on stories. Like um, they didn't believe it right away, but then this happened and this happened, and then they went back and they heard about the the ladies that went in, and so uh, so I, I thought it was kind of um it doesn't happen right away uh, sometimes yes but but like 
growing up doesn't happen right away. Waking up maybe. <laughs> so so really building on they they learned more and more and more and then they realized so by breaking the bread they there was this awakening at the that very moment so yeah and and, and in all of the up, there was also showing up they went back and said we have to tell you so they they decided to show up and uh -huh. and spread that news yeah you know, in all the gospel accounts of the resurrection, there is there's always walking to Jerusalem. There's always a journey. There's always coming and going, uh, and and that idea of the journey and the pathway is is in all the all the accounts. I'm still wondering, Christine. Um, they didn't believe the women because they were women. Hmm. Uh, so what did the woman do? They said, come with us and see her for herself. So the women insisted. I guess, I guess that's something we have to do as well. Insisting on what we've seen and believing in what we've seen or experienced in this case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that just came to my mind as well. Because whenever I hear they didn't believe them, I sort of, ah, yeah, typically Catholic attitude. <laughs> but Buddhism also took some time to accept women as that they can become enlightened. And not because they are women that they cannot. So, yeah, it takes some time. Well, he also, you know, at the tomb, there's again the accounts can be different but there's like a ghost there's an angel there's a vision men in robes white um you know the the light you know is emphasized the light is the the way and um it's almost you know that's the subtle body or even maybe the causal body and it's not often recognizable it is something, it wasn't until he's very, Jesus appears in a very concrete way and they touch his body where, you know, he was pierced and they look at his hands uh, to see the nail marks. They need to see that gross body to believe it's really him. And the women didn't, in fact, the women didn't see that as much. They didn't require that quite as much. The women got more of the subtle body, the visions, the angel. Um, so that, that's kind of an interesting thing. In some ways, they needed less of the obvious um, representation in order to believe. Does anybody have anything else? Otherwise, I'm going to go on. Anneli, you wanted to say something, and Beatrice, I, I, I thought you were about to say something too. Go ahead. To say there's something in the growing up part, when you were speaking about all of you now, there was a very interesting sensation, Gertrude, when you spoke. And it's a connection between seeing differently and the hand, you, mean you break the bread, the hands, you, you take the bread. Um, there's something with that body-mind connection there um, in the way we see. So there's a sensory thing going on there. When you were speaking about it, I felt that. But you also, Christine, what this reminds me of is also in, in shamanic uh, practices, in initiation, and Gertrude, you used the word initiation as well. It's similar, you know, you, you speak about uh, waking up, growing up, cleaning up and showing up. There's so many similarities in different religions with uh, that are similar stories, although it's very differently expressed and maybe differently experienced, but the essence of it is the same. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think that's one of the things that Ken Wilber does so well is talk about, well, several people do it. Um, uh, Richard Rohr does it very well also, but the perennial wisdom. Um, so now we've, we're now fortunate enough to be alive in a time where we can look back in history and understand all the wisdom that has accumulated for humankind. And we can see uh, and share uh, with each other now um, because our world has shrunk and, and we know things from all over the world. Now we can see the commonalities and, and the wisdom that is similar, the patterns that are there and, and the patterns are really what, you know, begins to emerge at, at second tier, the similarities. So I'm going to um, go on and talk about the three faces of spirit because that leads into the meditation that I wanted to do. So the three faces of spirit, sometimes called the one, two, three of spirit or the one, two, three of God um, are the first, second and third person. So from the first person, um, we experience, this is how you can experience uh, the spirit or the divine from these different faces. So the first person is uh, being God or being the divine and being it yourself from the I stance, I am. The um, second person is the I thou or the we. It is relationship. It is how you relate to um, another person, another concept, um, another organization, but it's a relationship. It's how the two, it's how things interact. Um, and this is often emphasized in traditional Christianity because they emphasize a relationship with God or a relationship with Jesus. Um, traditional Christianity does not, <laughs> except for a few mystics who had the first person experience of being the divine. Um, it's kind of frowned upon in uh, traditional mythic Christianity to think that you are God. You're not supposed to think that. Um, so they focus a lot on the second person, the relationship to Jesus or to God. And then the third person perspective is the, um, the it talking about the they, the him, uh, the she, uh, talking about the larger. It, it's really the um, lower right quadrant uh, where you see things that are the, the wholeness, the totality of things, okay? So these are different perspectives and different religions and practices emphasize different things. Of course, you know, meditating uh, is more, and some types of prayer are more from a first person perspective. Prayer also can be from a second, pers uh, second person perspective. If you are um, talking to somebody or something in your prayer that's talking to, and, and it's a relationship. And the third person perspective is often experienced through rituals and through gatherings, things that are bigger, things that are more um, complex and whole. So what I'd like to do is, is what I'm calling kind of the white dove meditation. So I would like you all to kind of settle in to your seat and get yourselves comfortable. And as I talk about um, the white dove, I want you, I'm gonna go through the first person, second person and third person uh, perspectives. Um, and I'll do them in that order. And I'd like you to see what resonates the most with you. Is there a perspective that you're most comfortable with, most familiar with, or something about it just kind of uh, resonates with you? So take a few deep breaths. And try to clear yourself 
of tension, of negativity. And I would like you to visualize a white dove. I want you to be the dove. And I want you to synchronize your breath as the wings of the dove lift. I want you to inhale. And as the wings of the dove lower, I want you to exhale. So you are lifting your wings and you are lowering your wings with your breath. And just try to synchronize that. As you are lifting, I want you to think of release, resurrection, salvation, emergence, rebirth, as you lift, kind of a growing up into something new that's going to emerge. And remember to associate with the wings because you are the dove, the dove is you. And as you lower your wings, think of your being. Think of your being here right now in this moment. Think of how lowering the wings grounds you. It grounds you and connects you to the earth and brings you back to the now. So there's this constant process as you are the dove. You are lifting towards resurrection and you are lowering towards being and groundedness. And see if you can associate with the, the movement of a dove the flight of a dove and the uniqueness of a dove. No other animal is like that. No other animal has that spirit. Think in first person as becoming free, as well as becoming grounded. You are having oscillating experiences within the self of lifting and resurrecting and grounding. In the second person experience of the dove, Think of the dove as something that you're in relationship to. The dove is relating to you and looking at you. You're looking into the eyes of the dove and the dove is looking into the eyes of you. And the dove is offering support And the dove is giving you an olive branch. The olive branch represents peace and calm. The dove looks at you with gentleness, with favor, and with love. and your experience of being with the dove is finding that grace 
the peace and the love. You are supported and totally accepted by being in the presence of the dove. Warm, embracing, beloved. And in the third person, the dove enables you to have a vision. And the vision is of the whole. The vision is of connectedness. The vision is looking at the vastness and the mystery. Think of soaring above it all, in the skies, in the heavens, above the earth, and looking down and seeing the completeness that is there. All the fragments, all the pieces coming together. All of the healing. The vision of connectedness, healing and becoming whole as there's a soaring, graceful, beautiful dove providing this message of what can be. And I'd like you to take a few more deep breaths and make them cleansing breaths, bringing you the peace, the grace and the beauty of this dove spirit. And when you're ready, you can come back. Thank you, Monia. <laughs> so what I'm curious about is how you related to the dove and if the first, second or third person perspective resonated most with you. I can go. Um... For me, it just, I had to come in a little bit, but then I could really like, with the wings, I, I could um, be that, do that. And, and the second was, I was not sure if I was still flying. I mean, like eye to eye, <laughs> but I was, we were somehow in the air um, and um, even the third part, it was like, first it was me and then it turned around like looking at me and then it turned back and more side by side looking at that vision. At, it was not so specific, the vision, but this whole thing, look at this. <laughs> Can't you see? And, you know, 
So I couldn't even tell which one was more powerful or um, so I, I liked it always. Um, yeah. And, and each had its power. I mean, each had, uh, yeah, another perspective, but uh, equally powerful, something like that. So but it was really nice to, <laughs> at the second, still being in the air myself. And I didn't, I didn't land somehow. For me also, I had very different experiences, but it's very difficult to say which was better or more resonating because they were all very intense. And I just felt them in very different parts of my body as well, like where I became aware of being it. And even as I speak about it, it's like all one. It's not separate. For me, definitely, I couldn't say which one was better or worse. It was not a criteria, but definitely different. And that it was surprising. You know, for instance, flying with it, uh, being the dove, the, being there, and you know, this is, now you can't see this because it's my background, but it was, uh, nice and then the second also talking with a dove that was being face to face and then definitely when the third person came it was a completely different level so and then i had this famous picture you know this three, three tri triangle where the dove is on on top and then i and uh, the i in the middle and that came to me in the at the end of the third perspective and I, I actually I really liked it thank you for me the first person was kind of a first and second person combined because I was imagining I don't know if you've seen those really high resolution slow motion videos of like a bird <laughs> flying and also because because we we're trying to breathe slowly I felt like I had to make the wings in, like I had to be in a slow motion state because if I imagined how a bird would fly just unless they're soaring you know there's there's it's much more erratic or quick in a way that I didn't want my breathing to be because then uh -huh. I felt like I'd <laughs> work myself up rather than be connecting um so I was kind of in and out of seeing seeing that video in my mind and then also trying to inhabit it. Um, I had a hard time having eye making eye contact with the dove. Um, I kept imagining the beady eyes and it didn't feel like something I wanted to make eye contact with. I don't think doves have beady eyes. I don't know, but that's maybe I'm thinking of a stuffed dove or something. I don't know. I That was hard for me. <laughs> um, you live and with too then, many pigeons. What? <laughs> you live with too many pigeons. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what it is. I've been around too many pigeons. Um, and then the third person, I, I kind of, I kind of imagined it with the dove was always part of the picture. So I was either looking up into the sky or into the heavens with the the dove flying, you know, in the foreground or reverse with the, the, well, the dove was in the foreground either way, but then there's like the whole planet or below. Um, that reminded me kind of like a 3D um, rendering or, or like a video game or something like that. I mean, I don't play video games, but, but there was something about, I, I guess I was thinking also about the Mars landing recently where they had that animation that showed 
you know, you could see it from different perspectives where where the rover was, um, and you know where it was in the descent process, and that's kind of how I felt where the the, the dove was kind of static, and then I was kind of panning, panning around to see what was around it. So those were my experiences. That's interesting because you know you're bringing forth the idea that. Our, our immediate experiences, such as, you know, looking at the Mars rover, it changes our perspective, at least temporarily. It may not change it permanently, but we do shift perspectives depending upon the things that we've most recently uh, experienced. That experience is sticking with you, obviously. Yeah, well, I relate it best to a first person but I had a difficult time to make myself clear that I'm not Jonathan Livingston Seagull, but a dove. Because I just was Jonathan Livingston Seagull. That's what I always, uh, what to me is uh, the, the best symbol of uh, being a bird, but rising higher and higher and higher and so when I came down and looked at the dove, I was still Jonathan Livingston Seagull. <laughs> I didn't, and, but as, from one bird to another, we sort of appreciated each other. Yeah, that were the two. But it was, it was it's amazing how one uh, picture you have in your mind get uh, sort of, uh, yeah, you said very clearly a dove, but I just saw the seagull. It was just, yeah, very strange. But thank you. It was a very beautiful meditation. Well, that's good. Again, you're you're bringing your lived experience into uh, the perspective that you're taking. So obviously, your perspective is going to be from your lived experience. And uh, Jonathan Livingston Seagull had a had an impact on you. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely, yeah. And the pigeons, the doves in Vienna are not very nice too, <laughs> like in New York, they just, yeah. But still, a dove is a dove and not a pigeon. Uh, like Beatrice said, it, it was really about soaring because otherwise you couldn't make it, <laughs> the breathing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I actually, um... The raise the I, I know a white dove. Um, there's one that lives somewhere in this neighborhood, and every now and then I see him and or her. <clears throat> it's um, really huge. I didn't know that doves could be that big, but it's um, I actually I I, I had the, the experience that Beatrice had that um, I thought I I'll have to breathe too fast and shallowly if I if 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 the dove is moving so actually the way I saw it was um, and from watching I have literally hundreds of morning doves that I see all the time in fact I was just now watching them taking their bath um, so I I watch them all the time but the white dove in particular it stays very still and it the so i breathe the way that i see the the dove breathe when it's still so the so the wings going up and going down was in a very small um perimeter or what parameter i don't know what what i'm doing but i mean it was very um it was the way that it was breathing in and out very gently and when you really watch a a bird when it's still and it's breathing, you see the you see the the feathers and the wings moving in and out very softly, and it's, it's actually very very restful to watch. And or when they're sleeping, because I've watched birds sleeping too. Because I have I have all these morning doves all the time, so I I know all their habits. So it's actually a really nice feeling to feel this kind of in and out. And then when I saw the dove face to face that was easy too because I I do see them although they're very the, the white dove that I know um, that I know <laughs> um, is not at all afraid of people it's obviously obviously it belongs to somebody um, because it it's quite 
it's comfortable around when it comes to visit. It's just, it doesn't fly away if I approach it. Whereas the morning doves that I know intimately are very skittish. I, I, they're, they're constantly brushing away. But um, anyway, I didn't want to give a lecture on doves, but, but for me, it was, it felt really natural because I know this white dove. And so, but then the really amazing thing that happened is when it went into the, so that was intimate. The, the, the first person and the second person were both intimate. And then when it went to the third person, I, um, it gave me a chill just now thinking of it. It's like suddenly the, I became the dove again. And I was, I was soaring out higher and higher and higher and higher. And then looking back and then I, I was so far out that I looked back at the whole, I saw the entire globe. And it was this very exhilarating feeling. And then when you talked about the peace and the, the olive branch, um, it sort of came back in from like this cosmic perspective. And then of course, because of the symbolism, I felt like I was Noah on the ark and the dove had, had flown all the way around the world to see if there was a new land and had found the olive branch and it was bringing it back. And it was this sense of peace that, oh, now, now there's land. Now I can finally get out of this arc. <laughs> anyway, it was, it was a big experience. So thank you. It was, it was um, quite expansive or expanding. Well, thank you all for sharing that. That was great. I appreciate your letting me uh, practice on you all. Since I only will have a half an hour in my talk, I'm obviously going to have to pare things down <laughs> because we've spent uh, about an hour doing it. So, um, but I thank you for uh, all your wisdom and thoughts and uh, experiences. Yeah, thank you, Christine. And yeah, we do a short check out. Monia, do you want to? Yeah, I was just wondering uh, because the topic of resurrection is a great one. And maybe we could talk next time about resurrection in our lives, how we experience resurrections, because I have experienced quite a couple. <laughs> this is just a suggestion. And I would really like to expand that topic because it's an important one. How about you preparing that? I'll just do it often. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll prepare it. Okay. So, Gertra, will you continue with a uh, checkout? Yeah, thank you, um, Christine. It was, uh, it's so long ago <laughs> to, to really listen to this story and, yeah. For me in German, it was more normal. Uh, so having even that brought me another perspective. Just listen to you in speaking in English about it. It it, it kind of went out. So not uh, loaded with all the bad stuff that that I know. Um, yeah, <laughs> with a Catholic upbringing in a in the traditional way. So. So I could really listen without any any old um, feelings or any trigger points or anything like that. That was really good to to have that in English. And yeah, and thank you for. Um, so I've never thought of this <laughs> in that way. So it really brought a new perspective into, uh, yeah, this this story especially. Yeah. And thank you for Monia <laughs> taking my suggestion and, and preparing it because, yeah, I think we all know it. Like, if you call it Phoenix or whatever, yeah, um, yeah, to 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 uh, relate it to our personal lives. That that's a that's a very good idea. Yeah, and thanks, ladies. It was again another wonderful hour to share. You give over?
to the autumn lady in Johannesburg. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. It was really very sacred and special. And also the way your voice, um, it just landed beyond just the words for me as well. And the meditation was most beautiful. My body really loved, I really experienced it so deep in my body in different ways that you know, it's going all over. So thank you so much and everybody else for being present here together in this way. And I'm handing to Victoria. Thank you, Hanali. I'm, um, I'm just reveling in all my birds that are come, my breakfast birds, as I call them. <laughs> They're all coming to drink water now. Um, so I was a little bit distracted. Um, yeah, thank you, Christine. And I um, I would really love to, um, if it would be possible to attend the, the meeting when you give your presentation with the other two. I, it's, I find it really fascinating because um, I think what, what is so interesting is to, is to see see this this familiar stories from different perspectives and um and and look at you know different um you know how, how much one can sort of extract from the images and so um this was really fascinating for me and i'd love to get more of a sense because um it's this is the well this is how um well heidi <laughs> how heidi lured me <laughs> into her world because um my i'm i'm still sort of an infant in the in no, understanding the whole integral movement and um when i've tried to read um ken wilbur i always feel it, it feels dry and mm -hmm. so i i really it's it's very intellectual and it's 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 fascinating um but i feel like the way i can really learn more about it is is through a kind of incarnational experience to to really be with people who are living from these principles and embodying them in some way so so i um yeah so this i would really love it if i could um attend. can you put your can you put your email in the chat yeah and okay. i think i have your email i think i think once you invited me but i had a conflict i had to go to a concert or something um but i would love yeah, and maybe Beatrice too, because um, she's more or less on the on the same time. I mean, not nine hours apart. From... <laughs> oh, I sent Beatrice my email address. <laughs> okay. Um, let's yeah, see. We can uh, also in my invitation or reminder uh, email. Yeah, I, I'll send send you an email. email. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just yeah. But anyway, I just I really appreciate it, um, and um, it's it's yeah it's it's opening up a whole whole new vista. So thank you, and and I really love the the um, I loved identifying with my white dove. <laughs> I wrote something in the chat for you, Victoria. Have you read Grace and Grit by Rubo? No. Then definitely try it. Yes. Okay. Definitely. It's a beautiful book. Yeah, beautiful and not at all intellectual and goes right to your heart. It's the last book I cried oh. uh, a lot. Good recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll look into it. Thank you. So Beatrice and Christine. Okay. <laughs> I guess that's the order. Um, yeah, no, thank you. Thank you, Christine. Um, similarly, I'm I'm even newer to Integral because my mother brought me in <laughs> to this group. So um, as you were saying things, I was furiously Google searching and, and looking at images and, and trying to get some senses. So I, I need to do my homework um, to understand more of that perspective where the where the um, uh, the Christian uh, upbringing and and perspective is something I'm much more familiar with. So um, I, I, I look forward to learning more about integral and to, to more fully understand how you were bringing the two together. Um, yeah, and the the meditation was was lovely. Um, 
still <laughs> I had my I had my interesting experiences with it, but I I really I, I've been enjoying also just experiencing different kinds of meditation and visualizations to access different different parts of myself and my relation to to the world, the universe, the people in, in the room. Um, so thank you for for guiding in another another one of those. Um, yeah, I'm excited about about next week to be able to talk more about the implications of everything that was brought up today. Because I think I think we probably all would love to just <laughs> talk for another hour. I mean, not right now. I know we all have things to do, but um, but to have some time to really have a discussion about about this because there's there was so much depth and so much in there. So thank you, and I look forward to next time. Well, again, thank you all. It was really nice for me to share with you. Um, it felt really good to, to be here with you all and to listen to your experiences. And you're just such a lovely and delightful group of women. I love it. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. I put in the chat, there is Paul Smith, who has written Integral Christianity, I think. And then he's doing We Spaces. I, Afterwards, I will have a group of German people. We met about one and a half years ago in one of his three spaces, and then we split over to do it in German. It's more than a year ago, and we still meet. And it's interesting because, you know, uh, we do meditations in together and full body meditation, he calls it. So if you are interested in uh, combining let's say spirituality and, and integral, I think that would be a good idea to go to. I say it also because I know somebody might watch the video and might be interested in that too. Uh, yeah, I might also put in the, in the description these things. And also, Christine, if, if you don't mind, you could send me the, the text you, you read and also the meditation. And I could publish that if, if you don't mind. Okay, so ladies, thank you very much. It has become very dark. I have no lights on. That's only the computer and you can see me. And uh, it was nice again to see you. And we meet again in very short time under the guidance of Monia. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. <laughs>